Welcome Rebels to another video where we talk tactically about Star Wars Destiny. I'm your host Rebel Gray and today we're going to talk about the importance of consistency. And what I mean by this is how often your deck is going to pull off what it is built to do. That could be discarding opponent's cards or dealing damage, even drawing the right cards at the right time. And in this video series, because this is the first part of at least two, we're going to dive into some of the current decks in the meta and discuss how consistency is often the key to victory at those big tournaments. I'll throw in some number stuff, combo related concepts, and hopefully it'll all make sense in the end. Let's get it going after these important messages. Destiny has a ton of variation or inconsistency to it. And one of the approaches that high level players keep in mind when constructing the best decks out there is to try and minimize that inconsistency as much as possible. And they do that by understanding the importance of consistency within their deck. But that variation, randomness, or whatever you want to call it that we're trying to defeat comes in a variety of flavors. And they're all important to understand so that you can become a better deck builder over time. The first hurdle to deck consistency is paper consistency. And I refer to that as any consistency that is created by the card test text itself, whether that be a character ability or an effect of playing a card or something like that. Now, this game has some very straightforward deck building rules, right? If we're talking constructed, we're looking at a 30 card deck, one or two copies of each card. We've talked about that before, of course, but when it comes to consistency related to the actual drawing of cards, or cards you want, there are some concepts worth going even deeper into, and we'll be doing that over the next couple of sections. The second battle you have to win is the plastic consistency, or the dice rolling what you want. Now you're probably thinking, well, Gray, if I could control what my dice roll, I'd be in Vegas, not playing some silly Star Wars game. And I agree, but these aren't your usual six-sided dice either. We've got to talk about things like die faces and rolling odds to get down to the nitty-gritty of die consistency. We're actually going to save all that stuff for part two of this series because there's just so much to cover and I don't want to have to shove it all into one release and, and try to, it just becomes a big mess at that point. So let's start with just the first of these two concepts, the paper consistency. And I'll mention a deck at the end too that right now, as of late November 2017, is the king of consistency for all the reasons that we're going to talk about leading up to it. In a past video, we discussed mulligan odds, and knowing that stuff is essentially the primer to understanding card draw consistency. However, it's not the entire answer. It's actually just a piece of it, although a very important piece, right? One must also consider card impact, as that is directly tied to how many copies of the card that you will include in your deck. So for example, a card like He Doesn't Like You remains in the upper echelon of die removal cards because it has a high impact, allowing you to remove your worst die to remove the opponent's best die. It requires both you and the opponent to have a die in the pool. Ideally, one you want to get rid of in exchange for one, you really don't want them to resolve. And there's very little consideration for its include and impact past that, but there also doesn't need to be because that's good enough to cement itself as a two of in just about every yellow villain deck anyway. Cards like Bait and Switch also continue to be high impact cards, but the consideration for this card is a little different when compared to He Doesn't Like You. Bait and Switch requires a die we're using it on to have both a resource side and also another side that we want to resolve. In typical gameplay, this card is used to flip a resource side into damage, then using the ambush to resolve all damage of the type simultaneously. The thing is, finding a die that has both a resource side and a damage side on it isn't a huge hurdle as it turns out. So the requirement for this card is easily satisfied by the game's natural design. So it then becomes incredibly consistent. Most aggro characters have a resource and a damage side, right? So in cases like Sienna Re, who we're gonna talk about a little more in the next video, she actually has two resource sides, making her interaction with this card even more consistent as a result. Lastly, a card like Force Strike brought a lot of consistency to Vader-centric decks throughout the Awakenings meta. And this card hasn't exactly lost any of its consistency either. It still works just fine as it stands. And just as with the previous card, it essentially has a requirement that the die it is used on must have a melee side this time, right? 
And that's pretty easy to build around. In fact, you don't really need to build anything. You just look for a character die that has a melee side, and then you throw this card in your deck, right? Furthermore, it just turns the die from any other side to this one single melee side. So it's kind of like a reverse bait and switch, if you think about it, right? It requires no side to flip it to a side you want. Bait and switch is the opposite. It turns out that making your dice show whatever you side <laughs> whatever side you want or affecting any side to become a side you definitely want is pretty amazing in Destiny, especially when you can resolve it immediately. Well, why is that? And that's because dice aren't exactly cooperative in the game of Destiny or any game with dice, right? And in the next video, we're going to talk and take this concept and pull it out even further so that you understand more about it. All right, so we talked about some cards that outright create consistency in your deck by flipping dice to whatever sides you want and stuff like that. And those cards are probably cards that you want to run of, uh, run as two ofs because they have such a high impact on your game. Force Strike, not included, of course, because apparently you can win worlds with just a single copy of it. But moving on, not all high impact cards are worth including in your deck twice. And the factors that go into... Uh, this include most of the usual things, but I'm going to mention a couple of them. Things like meta calls, things like draw odds, things like resource requirements, and things like interactions with characters, and similar stuff are all factors that you want to take into consideration when asking yourself, how many copies of this do I want in my deck? Well, I'm going to lead you down a path of thought for some of these, and perhaps that will help guide you when you're building your future decks. So let's begin with meta calls, okay? Meta calls is something that we've definitely talked about before, and all it means is that the inclusion of a card in your deck appears to have a high consistency rate of success in your particular meta or whatever meta you're talking about, whether that be the regional meta or the global meta. And meta calls become harder to predict on a, the larger that the stage for playing the game actually gets. So right now, a card that many consider to be a serious meta call is Rand. And the reason for that will depend primarily on the existence of Holocron and Four Speed at this point. Uh, Imperial Inspection has kind of fallen out of favor for the most part, and Salvage Stand is only run in very specific decks, and those decks aren't super popular. So because they're not, you're not going to see Rend as an automatic include, right? But since Holocron itself has such a high impact and is a relatively consistent card, Rend is a silver bullet that may make or break a lot of the matchups against Sith Holocron. So remember that you can always play the safety on a meta call by including a one of in your deck. And Rend is just that kind of card right now. Next is the concept of draw odds. And the odds of drawing a card are going to vary as the game progresses based on the remaining size of your deck and how many copies of it have already been played. And that's either one copy or zero in Destiny since we can only include two copies of a particular card, right? For high-impact cards, we generally want to include two copies so that we can turn those cards into high-impact plays. Seems simple enough, right? More of a good card generally means more chances to use it, and more uses out of it can increase consistency, assuming we're talking about cards that create consistency. And since that's the topic of this video, you're going to want to pay attention to the next couple of sections really, really closely. So next, let's talk a bit about resource requirements. And this is a concept that has two primary sub-considerations. And the first is quite simple, and it's an argument on quantity. Destiny has a very high number of zero-cost, high-impact cards. And the great thing about zero-cost cards, of course, is that they can be played regardless of the amount of resources that you have at any given time. They're always free, so you can play them liberally. And you can play a large quantity of them on any given turn. And you can even pack almost your entire deck with them at this point because there's just so many cards to choose from. But it's not enough to just play them. They have to matter when you play them. And here are some examples of cards that bring consistency to your deck when you play them, when they matter most. And I'll say a bit about each one of them. And the first one is Caution. And Caution is an incredibly consistent card because it effectively trades one die of any kind to give another character three shields. And when I say it has to be a character die, but when I mean any kind, it can be any side, right? It can even be a blank. So 
you could see this as a three health boon in a non vibro world. And the magic is that it lets you trade essentially trash for gold. Shields matter now more than they have in a while. And Caution is a great card with a consistent static effect. And that makes it a two of in every hero deck running blue for the most part. Friends in low places is another consistent include in decks for a few reasons. Firstly, a lot of decks run yellow for the removal, and this is a neutral card, so it can go in both hero and villain decks. It gives you hand knowledge every time you play it, assuming you can spot the yellow, right? Then, it lets you remove an event costing one or less, so it itself hits most removal cards in the game, including this card itself, if your opponent's hanging on to one. It lets you enhance the consistency of your dice resolution in many cases, because everybody plays removal cards. You can count on friends in low places, being effective with a fairly high consistency as a result of generally accepted deck construction guidelines, which is about four to eight removal cards, six to eight, depending on the archetype you're playing, something like that. Lastly, I'm going to mention logistics as a very consistent card in both deck presence as well as effect. It just resolves a resource die and gives you an extra one from it. It is inevitable that you will want to resolve a resource face at some point in your game of destiny. And so this card lets you take advantage of that particular resolution by granting you a bonus to it. You can't really go wrong with it if you're playing a deck that needs a few extra bucks to do its job either on this turn or maybe the next round or something like that. Thus, it adds consistent resource generation in a time you would otherwise already be taking that action anyway, right? So what's not to like? What you are looking for in cards of this nature are those that create a powerful static effect at a low cost that you can play at any time. And these three cards are wonderful examples of cards that you're going to see a lot in a lot of the high level decks because they create consistency just by existing in your deck, by playing them at the right time too. Really helps a lot. The second consideration enter quantity is of course quality. Some cards still do have a high resource cost, but they're considered worth it for the consistency they bring to a deck and the game of Destiny in general. And here's some examples of those. Hyperspace Jump is a great card because it lets you get out of a jam fast. In previous videos, I've actually talked about the inclusion of dodge or block index, and those costs too, and they teeter on the edge of being worth it, quote unquote, for their cost because they want to remove specific die faces, and oftentimes uh, good players may know that you're holding on to that, those kinds of cards. So they're going to try to play around it as best they possibly can or bait you into using it. Hyperspace Jump, on the other hand, is very well costed at three, although some might disagree, and it doesn't care what your opponent's dice are actually showing. Qualitatively, it can replace the use of block and dodge in many decks. It also lets you swap the battlefield, something that otherwise costs two using a card like New Orders. And in terms of quality, when deck space is at a premium, this becomes a great consideration to replace mass removal cards at just one additional resource cost over dodge and block. Endless Ranks is a card that also wanders around in the competitive scene from time to time. And right now it's even present in, a, in the four wide decks. And it costs a whopping five resources. So a lot of players are going to look at this card and immediately ignore it because it's five. They're going to say, man, that's an uphill battle, you know, especially in red decks, which are often paying to shoot their guns. Even two copies of logistics alone can't make the magic happen here all by itself. But coupled with a number of other cards to generate resources like Aftermath, Endless Ranks becomes a card that consistently extends your game another seven or even ten hit points by reviving a First Order Stormtrooper or a Death Trooper, respectively. So if you can consistently find a way to generate large amounts of resources, you can consistently make this work once or even twice per game. It's a quality card worth running in your deck in the event that you can make all those things happen. Now, premonitions tricks aside, Rise Again is another card that costs five that adds consistent value to your blue villain deck. For five resources here again, it heals five HP, and it lets you pull an upgrade from the discard pile and put it directly into play. So let's compare that to something like Field Medic, right? Which would be 
if you could, two and a half resources to do the same thing. And that would hypothetically take you three actions, if you could even do that. And combine that with playing an upgrade of, say, four cost, like Force Lightning, would be well over five resources and four actions to complete all of those things. So Rise Again is incredibly efficient because it saves you actions by combining all those different effects into a single action and card. And yes, you're paying for all that. And, but it is very much worth it in the grand scheme of things. This is a card of quality that adds a level of pseudo consistency to your deck by extending your game another five hit points and also increasing your character's power level by one more dice card. And what we're really talking about here is not only impact of cards, but also their value in the course of a game. In some cases, these cards combine multiple effects from other cards, as you've seen. In some cases, they do things that no other card can do, and they even bend or break the rules of destiny. The point is that even high resource costing cards can bring consistency to a deck through their impact and value in play. Don't count them out simply because they appear too expensive for your blood. It might very well be that all the effects they provide are actually worthwhile at the cost printed on the card. Okay, we are not quite done tackling the paper consistency part of this video series just yet. I also want to talk about character interactions a little bit and highlight a particular deck that is presently taking Destiny by storm. Or maybe it's just a rain shower, I'm not really sure. But if you ask me, I think it's a fad. And the deck that I'm talking about is R2P2, and that includes the new Ray from the two-player game, as well as new Poe from the two-player game, and their buddy C3PO. And this deck thrives off moving very slowly, but consistently, building a board state that becomes unmanageable in its totality, in part by fault of the game designers. And what I mean by that is that the deck runs off specials all day long, but so many specials that you can't control them all and you can't interact with a lot of them. So let's look at Poe and his interaction with the highest powered card in the deck, the handcrafted Lipo. The beauty of Poe's special and the nature of the rules is that you can resolve all die of a given type one after the other. Since Poe's special allows you to turn another die, if you turn that die to a special, you can literally chain into Lipo special and use its effect immediately. Essentially, it doesn't matter what you roll on Lipo, as long as you can roll Poe's special. And when all else fails, no matter what Poe's dice are telling you, you can use C3PO's action to resolve anything that Poe rolls as a special and chain into the lipo that way. And this harkens back a little bit to the days of the original Poe Maz deck, which really weren't too long ago, even though it seems like the Dark Ages at this point. Maz didn't really care what Poe rolled as long as she herself could roll a focus, which she had a 56% chance to actually do. Now, going back to the deck, while chaining these specials, the deck also gains shields to add survivability every round. Those in turn can be used to block damage or repost for extra damage on the opponent. The deck survives primarily because it creates a decent pillow fort of shields for itself while just outputting consistent damage with special usage every single turn. And even if the opponent wanted to do something about it that mattered, you can't remove special sides and multiples without a force misdirection in this game. And so your options are then minimized to removing a C3PO die or taking a ton of damage. And at that point, you begin to question the validity of Destiny. I know that when I've played against this deck, I have thought that way in a lot of, in a lot of games because I want to be able to mitigate just one die to kind of stop the whole thing, and that's not always possible. And with the concept, uh, what that concept and this one illustrates together is how powerful and important really good character actions can be in bringing consistency to a deck. And we didn't even talk about how every time he uses that special, he gives Ray a shield, which then allows her on activation to do a damage to a character, okay? So the pattern here is that in many of the so-called tier one decks that you're gonna see out there, character interaction directly contributes to, to the consistency and thus the success of the deck. It is often, one of the highest considerations that players take into account when putting together character uh, sets. And it's not just point values, right? It's abilities too. So it takes a sharp eye and rigorous playtesting 
to really bring out the potential of those decks. And it took a lot to bring out the potential for this deck. Now, what we just talked about moves the conversation away from consistency on paper and towards something that I'll call plastic consistency in the next video. And that is all consistency related to the dice themselves. To hear more, I guess you're just going to have to wait for the next release, eh? As we close out this video, I want to summarize the biggest key points to all of this. And it's that paper consistency often improves our plastic consistency. In other words, cards making our dice better is usually what improves our deck the most. We saw this from the very beginning with cards like He Doesn't Like You, which is a great value trade with our dice. We went deeper, but looking at Bait and Switch, Force Strike, and even Poe Dameron Special, and how his ability improves our die consistency. When we consider the resource values of cards, which don't impact our dice necessarily, we're often looking at a quantity and quality argument for including those cards in our deck. Do we want a lot of small to medium impacts over time? Yes. Do we want some heavy hitting impact cards a couple of times per game? Also yes. We can discover the worth of these cards over that spectrum through playtesting and a good eye for what we already know brings consistency. There's a good chance that cards that are similar to those already in print that do a certain thing may likely be as good depending on the drawback or the trade-off that those that is associated with those particular cards. But really, this is the only the first portion of this conversation. To go deeper into the concept of cultivating consistency for our deck, we're going to need an understanding of some dice rolling odds. And to present that, I'm going to do a whole other video for you guys, which should be out sometimes next week. And I've already got an interim video planned for this Friday to talk about some stuff going on with me personally. So if you like what we're building up here so far, you can join my rebellion by hitting the subscribe button below. And don't forget to tell your friends who might just be getting into Destiny and are looking for some videos on concepts and about the game itself. Also, you can check out my other social media links as well in the show notes. I feel like we're going somewhere with this. So I want you guys to stay tuned to the channel for the updates that are coming soon uh, because you're not going to want to miss any of that stuff. So until next time, remember, there is do or do and not. There is no try. Also, I am probably not your father. And may the force be with you.